Amen. Would you now stand for the reading of God's Word? Our passage is Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. It's page 907 in your pew Bibles. If you don't have a Bible of your own this morning, uh, feel free to hunt one of these red pew Bibles up. Turn to page 907. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. And let me encourage you, this is... Um, a bit of a little long little story here. I just want to encourage you, as the scripture is being read, to try to put yourself into the story. It's oftentimes how biblical narratives work on our hearts. They invite us into the story to experience it as if we were there. So we invite you, imagine yourself here uh, as a part of this story. Time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Emily. Would you pray with me once more as we come to God's word? Let's pray together. Father, we pause as we come to your word, and as we consider and enter into the story that for some of us might be very familiar, but Lord, a story that we need to rediscover the wonder of this morning, that we would see in it your heart, your rescue, your grace, your salvation. Would you come and encourage us with who you are and all that you've promised to do for us, even in the midst of the darkness of this world? In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So kids, um, <clears throat> a question, it's kind of a rhetorical question here, but do you ever hear people in your life say, don't get your hopes up? You ever heard that phrase? You know, it's, uh, it's one whenever I was a kid, I used to hate hearing that. Because as a kid, and this is really the beautiful thing about children, is you're always getting your hopes up. 
you're always having these huge expectations of what's going to happen and you get excited and wonder is real and, and you're always looking ahead to something. That's called hope. And you're always getting your hopes up. But the reality is, is that often, I find myself as a parent, I find myself saying to my children, don't get your hopes up. Now, why do we say that? We say that because we're trying to manage expectations. Because we know intuitively that whenever you get your hopes up about something, when you're really hoping in something and it doesn't happen, it hurts. Hope hurts, doesn't it? Especially whenever hope gets really big. And the reality is, is that there's so many times in this world that things do not turn out the way that we hope. That things don't pan out the way that we imagine. That oftentimes our life doesn't go the way that we had hoped or imagined that it was. The reality is, is that this life can get so hard. And so the reality for us as adults, I mean, it's kind of the sad thing whenever you leave being a child and you become an adult, is that a lot of times we forget how to hope, don't we? You know, you go along in life and the reality is, is that life often just beats you up because this life is hard. And what happens is that as you get all grown up, you don't hope anymore because again, you know, hope hurts. And so you learn how to just turn hope off. Part of what begins to happen in us is we get cynical. We shut down our hearts again because hope hurts. And now 2020, it's been a doozy, hasn't it? It's been one of those years where hope has been beat up left and right. It's been an incredibly hard year. It's been dark in so many ways. We have, we have seen things that we love taken away from us. We've been separated from one another. So much of what we uh, enjoy about normal life and relationship it's been taken away and it feels like hope over and over just gets dashed. On top of that, we're walking through fear and illness and all these various things. So we find ourselves right now in a time where hope is hard. We don't want to hope. We want to shut down hope. But we need hope, especially in the darkness of this world. So in our Advent series, we're going to be talking about where does hope come from? Is hope just naive optimism that things are going to be okay? Or is there actually a firm and sturdy hope that we can actually begin to hope and trust in even in the midst of a world that so often does seem to be dark? As we walk through our Advent series, I want to kind of look at the, the story of the birth of Jesus through the lens of Isaiah's prophecy. So in Isaiah chapter 9, it was read at the beginning uh, in our call to worship today. But in Isaiah's prophecy of the coming Messiah, one of, the, one of the most beautiful prophecies of what Messiah would come to do and to bring, uh, there's one verse in particular right at the very beginning that really perfectly describes what Christmas is all about, what we celebrate at this time. In verse 2, and I want to encourage you to, to memorize Chapter 9, verse 2, as we go through our Advent series. But here's what he says about the coming of Messiah. Um, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. That's his description of what the coming of Christ means. And the story, as we, as we walk through the story in the book of Luke, of the birth of Jesus, part of what we see is that the Bible is incredibly honest about the darkness of this world. The world, uh, the, the Bible is not Pollyanna or minimize the full reality of this world. In fact, we see it even more than we often even want to. We see the full reality of the darkness of this world, but yet in the very midst of that darkness, God's light dawns upon us. The hope of Christ comes into our darkness. And no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're walking through, the ultimate hope that we have, an immovable hope, is the light of Christ who has come and will one day return in glory. That's what we see in our passage today. So we're looking here at the beginning of the uh, book of Luke. Luke 
in his story about the birth of Jesus, uh, he spends more time than any other gospel writer. In fact, he spends two whole chapters, and if you're familiar with the book of Luke, you know a chapter for Luke is like super, super long. He spends so much time on the birth of Jesus. But one of the interesting things about the birth narrative here is how much time he spends describing other characters before you even get to Jesus. That's where we start here in verse 5. He doesn't even introduce Jesus yet. In fact, that will come much later. He starts here with an old priest named Zechariah. Now, why does he do that? Why does Luke spend so much time introducing us to these other characters and to their life and to these experiences before you ever get to Jesus? And it's kind of like what happens if you've ever been to a concert. You ever been to a music concert? You know, you come there to see a particular act, you know, the main event. But you know, you don't ever start there, do you? You don't ever walk into a concert and then all of a sudden the band just walks straight out and starts playing. No, no, you don't do that because you're not ready for it. You've got to get worked up. You've got to get good and lathered up. You've got to get excited. You know, the crowd's got to get... They've got to get fired up and ready. So you've got an opening act. Sometimes you get a couple of them. And their job is to come out and to get the crowd ready for the main event. That is what Luke is doing as he walks us through the life of Zechariah. He takes us back into his story so that we would become prepared for the main event, the coming of Christ into our world. So as we look here at the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the first thing I want us to see is just the darkness of their circumstances in their world. And there's so many details in the story here that help us to see this was a really, really tough time. Times were very dark when this began to take place. We see that right off the bat whenever he introduces the section here, and he says in verse 5, in the time of King uh, Herod, king of Judea. Just right off the bat, if you know anything about the history of the New Testament, you know that that is introducing us and bringing us into a time that was incredibly dark. King Herod was ruling over Judea. King Herod was brutal. He had come to power in A.D. 38, kind of put in position through the Roman Empire. He made a deal with them, and whenever he came to power, he slaughtered much of his family. Anybody that would be seen as a rival to his throne, he would just kill them. And you know from, if you're familiar with uh, the birth narrative in Matthew, after the birth of Jesus, he is so paranoid about anyone coming to take his throne. And, and of course, the hearing of the birth of Messiah is a direct threat to his throne. He has all the baby boys in, in Bethlehem under two years old slaughtered. This was a brutal time. If you're worried about the leadership in our country right now, and many of us I know are, if you're worried about kind of the direction of things in our culture, let me just assure you, it's been worse. The reality that they were living in is beyond what we can even imagine. They were living under Roman oppression. I mean, if you think taxes are bad now, you cannot imagine the taxes of the Roman Empire. This was an incredibly dark time. Now, out on top of that, it had been 400 years since God's people had heard from a prophet. You know, the Old Testament ends with the, the book of Malachi, and after Malachi's prophecy, there's 400 years of just silence. Imagine that 400 years waiting on God to show up and to fulfill His promises and to do something. That's where they were. They're wondering, God, where are you? They're looking at their circumstances. They're incredibly hard and dark. And they're thinking, where, do you see us? Where are you in this? When, when are you going to come and fulfill your promises? And now on a personal level, we learn in the story that things were hard and dark for Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. We're told a number of times in here, first in verse 7, that they had no children. Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. They were unable to have children. They were old. In this day, to be childless was uh, equal to economic and social disaster. 
I mean, in this day, it was a, it was a sign of shame. It was, uh, uh, it was something that would have been, uh, the community would have, would have criticized them for. And, and it was a very shameful thing to be without children in this day. Children in this day were also your social security. It was how you would be taken care of whenever you were old. I mean, this was, this was a very hard reality they were facing in their life. And there was no prospect of children. They're very old, and they know there is no, help, there is no hope for the end of their life. It's an incredibly hard reality for them, something no doubt they would have been crying out to God with from years and years and years. Now, some of us know the reality of infertility and how painful and difficult that can be and that was the reality for Zechariah and Elizabeth so as we come into this story you have gotta see the darkness the stark darkness of their reality but at the same time you've got to see the incredible light that begins to enter into their lives in this story you know, it's, it's an amazing as you just kind of imagine that you're Zechariah in this, in this story here. Zechariah was a priest. Uh, there were many priests, and they had different divisions of the priesthood. And at different times, that division would be on duty in the temple for the, the various daily duties of the temple. And in the temple, every day there would be the burning of incense in the morning and the evening. Now, at this altar, the burning of incense, it was in the inner court of the temple. Only the priest would go in there to burn this incense. It was a very special honor. And so uh, Zechariah's, um, his his company was on duty. He gets this amazing privilege as the lot falls to him to go in and burn the incense. Many priests would have never had this opportunity in their entire lives. So this is amazing privileges. Zechariah goes into the temple. All of the worshipers are outside the inner court and they're praying. The incense, the burning of incense was symbolic of the prayers of God's people. As the smoke would rise up from the altar, it was a visible symbol of the prayers of God's people rising up to him. And so Zechariah comes into the temple, this amazing privilege. He comes to the altar. He is burning incense. And then, boom, the angel Gabriel appears at the right of the altar. And he is immediately struck. You see this same reaction that you see anytime anyone encounters an angel. Now, it doesn't happen a whole lot, even in Scripture. Whenever it happens, it is a moment where the person that encounters them is struck with fear. I mean, the, the awesomeness of a being that literally is in the presence of God, the very presence of God uh, for all of eternity. Their glory itself is just astonishing. And the moment that Zechariah sees Gabriel, he is struck with fear. Of course, Gabriel encourages him and begins to bring incredibly good news for Zechariah. He says to Zechariah, your prayers have been heard. You imagine that. Zechariah has likely been praying all of his life for a child. And at this moment, Gabriel is standing before him and says, your prayers have been heard. You and your wife will conceive a child. And not just any child. He is going to be great. He is going to be a prophet of the Most High. After 400 years of silence, but your son, now this is John the Baptist, that they're introducing us to, but he is going to be great. He describes that he will bring Israel, many of God's people, back to the Lord, that he will, in verse 17 we see, he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. That takes us back to the very close of the Old Testament. The prophecy of the book of Malachi, where at the very end it talks about just before the Messiah comes into the world to bring about all of God's promises to fruition, that, they will, uh, that uh, the prophet Elijah will come as a forerunner to him. A very mysterious prophecy. What is this going to look like? Is Elijah the great Old Testament prophet? Is he going to come back? What does this look like? And here the angel Gabriel says, no, no, that's your son. 
He's going to come in the, in the spirit of Elijah. He will be great like Elijah, and his role will be to prepare God's people for the Messiah. That was what John the Baptist had come to do. That God had raised him up, that he would come, and he would come to God's people before Jesus, and then he would say, hey, God is coming to show his favor on his people. All those promises that we've been waiting for, for hundreds and thousands of years, he's bringing them to fruition now. Get ready. Make your heart ready. Turn back to the Lord. That was his role. It's kind of like this is the... Um, illustration I use to, to think about the role of John the Baptist. If you ever seen the uh, State of the Union address, you know it's this uh, very important thing whenever the President of the United States very formally address, uh, addresses an assembled Congress and all of the nation. And it's a pretty neat thing just to watch, uh, just the decorum and the things that happened during that time. But you know it's a pretty significant event. The person who holds the highest office of honor in our government is coming in that moment to stand before all of the leaders of our country and all of the country itself and to address us to speak. It's a very important moment. I can't imagine actually being able to be there. But if you watch just how it happens, it's pretty neat. You know, everyone is gathered in the chamber. You know, he doesn't show up till everybody's there. And that's kind of it's kind of how it is when you're a big deal, right? You've got to make an entrance. He's not just going to be standing in there and just waiting on everybody to come. He's not going to be early to the party. That's not what you do when you are the main event, right? Everybody's got to get there. They've got to wait. They've got to get ready. They've got to anticipate. And that's what's happening as you're watching the footage there. Everybody's, you know, shaking hands and cutting up and making deals, you know. And they're all in there talking. And then, at a very pivotal moment, this person walks into the room with a very special honor. And they say in a very loud voice, they get everybody's attention, and they say, Mr. Speaker. They address the Speaker of the House. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. And then everyone turns and begins to applaud and he makes his entrance into the room. You see, any time someone of that weight, of that honor, is going to come before his people and address them, they have to be introduced. You have to be prepared. Your attention has to be grabbed. You have to say, wait a minute, we need to turn and show respect here because he's here. That is the role of John the Baptist. To say to the Speaker of the House, to God's people, the Messiah is here. That is the special honor and privilege of John the Baptist. And so Gabriel is telling Zechariah, this is your son. He is the Elijah that was to come. I mean, this is, for Zechariah, the most amazing news you can ever imagine. And how does Zechariah respond? It's amazing. Look in verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, um, how can I be sure of this? Let me just paraphrase it here. That can't happen. That's impossible. That, that, do you know how old I am? Do you know how old my wife is? You know, Zechariah knows how this stuff works. An old lady does not give birth. It doesn't work that way. In the very moment that Zechariah is faced with the news that he has been praying for all of his life, look at that, he just can't believe it. You know, it's kind of like what happens in our life. You know, you long for something and you hope for something, and it doesn't work out the way that you think, or it doesn't come in the timing that you're hoping for, and you look at the reality of your circumstances and what begins to happen. You shut down hope because it hurts too much. And it just hurts to believe. It, it hurts to believe. Could this really happen for me? And Zechariah in this moment says, I just don't see how it could be. Now let me just give you a piece of advice. If an angel comes to you, should this happen, and gives you a piece of advice and gives you a promise, I just believe them, okay? I love the response of Gabriel here. Do you see this? Gabriel says, I'm Gabriel. I'm an angel. You know, you think, you know, you encounter an angel and they give you a piece of news, that would be enough proof, right? 
And that's kind of his response where he says, I'm Gabriel, one of the high commanders of the armies of the Lord. And I've been sent to you to give you the news that you've been hoping for all of your life. I stand in the very presence of God. You know, it's like, who do you think you are? You know, in that moment, uh, Zechariah's like, um, can I redo that right there? And Gabriel says, because you wouldn't believe my words, you're not going to have any words until this takes place. So Zechariah comes out of the temple. He's been in there forever. Everyone's wondering, okay, something's going on in here. It's kind of a dangerous thing to just go into the presence of the Lord in that day, to go into the temple. Has something happened here? Has he seen a vision? And Zechariah comes out, and he's gesturing to them. I mean, how do you gesture, I just saw an angel in here, right? Because he can't speak, you know, like, mm, mm, you know. I don't know. How, how's he doing that? But he comes out and he's gesturing and they realize, oh my gosh, something has happened. And then we're told he goes home and Elizabeth conceives. And I just love her response here. Verse 25, the Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. All of my shame from being childless all of my life. It's taken away. It's amazing to see that in the fulfillment of his promises, he does not forget our own personal desires and longings as they're fulfilled in her. So what do we see in this? What are we to see here? We see this thing that happens here that we see happening all over the Bible, this idea of a child that is born miraculously. That in fact, the way that God brings His provision is through the miraculous birth against all odds of a child. It's part of the heart of how God brings His promises to fruition. It ought to take us back, if you're familiar at all with the Old Testament, it ought to talk, take us back ultimately to Abraham and Sarah. Do you remember that? God gives this astounding promise to Abraham that through your family and your children and your descendants, I'm going to bless the whole world. And Abraham's like, um, you know we're old, right? You know we're infertile. We haven't been able to have a child. You know, uh, Sarah's pushing 80 at that time. He says, it's impossible. But what happens? God brings Isaac, right? Miraculously, against all odds, God fulfills His promises. It, it ought to remind us of Rachel as well, the wife of Jacob who was barren, and yet God opens her womb, and through her comes the, the tribes of Israel. We ought to think of uh, Hannah, and she too was barren and praying for a son to the Lord, and all of a sudden, here comes Samuel as she's in her old age. Samuel, the great prophet that would introduce King David to God's people. It's amazing as we see this pattern. And of course, the ultimate is what would happen with Mary. It would not just be long odds. It would literally be the impossible. So what do we see through this? We see this. When God fulfills His promises, He likes to stack the deck. He likes the long odds. You know, he could have come to somebody who was just ready to have that child. You know, somebody that you would imagine, you know, the right person. Say, okay, we're going to go through these people. These are the movers and the shakers. These are the people that are in the prime of their life. I'm going to go and choose them. But he doesn't do that. He goes to somebody who cannot conceive, who's been childless all of their life, who's on the verge of losing hope. And he comes and he says, yeah, I'm going to do it through them. He does the impossible. It's what Gabriel, the same Gabriel, will say to Mary when he'll say to her, you as a virgin are going to have a child and he's going to fulfill all the promises. You see, he does the impossible. He, he stacks the deck. Why does he do that? So that we see it is all of him and nothing of us. When we see it's got nothing to do with our human powers. It's something that He will accomplish. And because it's all of Him and all of His work, He gets all the glory. See, that is the story of Christmas, right? It's that into the very midst of darkness, a light has dawned. 
You know, it's very easy to think, especially in the philosophies of our culture, is that the light is within you. That we can figure it out. That we can get it all together. That we can improve things and we can fix things. If we just get together and we get the right philosophy and we just try hard enough, we often think that in our own hearts. If I can just get it together, then it's going to be right in my life. And I'm going to be right with God. But the reality is, is that God's light has got to come from the outside. It's not within us. It's got to be a miracle. It's got to be rescue. And so often in the circumstances of our life, He fulfills His promises after stacking the deck. He brings you into darkness. He brings you into circumstances that you can't make sense of. That you think, how am I going to get out of this? He makes the odds long so that whenever He comes and works in our life, it's clear. It's all of Him. And He gets all the glory. That's what Christmas is all about. He had to come rescue us. There was no way for us to get to Him. There was no way for us to figure it out. There was no way for us to be good enough to deserve this. There was no way for us to save ourselves. He had to come to us. He had to come down. Light had to dawn in our life. You know, the reality is, I think for most of us, life probably feels pretty dark right now. You know, maybe we're really struggling with hope, with losing hope in a lot of areas in our life. Maybe our life is not going the way that we had hoped. Maybe we're facing circumstances, a situation in your life, and you're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get out of this. Or maybe you're just worn out from the reality of 2020, where it's like everything you put your hope in seems to get snatched away at the last minute. What is your darkness? What are the circumstances that you're in right now? Because here's what this passage and the coming and incarnation of Christ shows us. God sees you. No matter what darkness you're in, God sees you. Sometimes in the reality of our circumstances, we think, God, where are you? You've forgotten about me. You're not here. You're not showing up in our life. And we lose hope there. But as we look at this... And we look at the coming of Christ, it tells us He sees you. Here's Zechariah. He feels utterly forgotten. And yet God comes and says, I see you. I know all those prayers. I was listening the whole time. And I had a plan for you. I see you. And my heart is for you. And I'm with you. And I will fulfill my promises to you. See, no matter how dark it gets, will you dare to believe that He is going to come through? That He is going to rescue? That His heart is for you? That His future for you is good? That ultimately, I mean, this ultimately what the coming of Christ shows us is that one day He will come into the midst of our darkness and glory and make all things new. That is the ultimate hope. The second advent of Christ. So this morning we get to come to the table, the communion table, which is this reminder. I mean, it roots us in Christ. It is a promise. It's a tangible promise that we touch and we taste. A promise that we are in Christ. And that no matter what darkness we walk through, the valley of the shadow of death, that He often walks us through in this life, that He is with us, that He will fulfill His promises to us, that His love is always with us. The guarantee and the reminder of that is at the table. So as we come, it bolsters our faith. It deepens us in the truth of the gospel. And that's what we experience at the communion table. So as we prepare our hearts to come to the table, let's first uh, pray and confess. Let's confess our sin to the Lord. Let's confess our need of His grace so that whenever we come to the table, we can receive the fullness of His grace that we need so very deeply. So let's pray together a prayer of confession. And I want to encourage you, uh, not just to read through these words. Let this be truly the prayer and confession of your heart to the Lord. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. 
Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Now take a few moments to confess your sin silently to the Lord. Father, we do confess to you that the reality of our hearts is darkness. That we have not loved you in the way that you have called us to. We have not loved our neighbor. Lord, we have run after so many things in our life in place of you. But Lord, we confess our sin and we now turn in faith to Jesus and his finished work on the cross. Would you now... Through the power of your Spirit, wash us and cleanse us and renew us that we would be empowered to live for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now hear this word of absolution from Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As we come to the communion table... Uh, It's important to remember that uh, this is called communion because it is for those who are in union with Christ. It is for those who are looking to Christ and trusting Him alone for salvation as Lord and Savior. If that is not you this morning or if you're unsure of where you are with Christ, you should not take communion. Instead, I would encourage you to take the real thing. I'd love to talk after the service or any time this week to talk about what that means. What does it mean to trust Christ and be united to Christ by faith? Um, But this is for those who are looking to Christ, those who are walking in repentance. And so that if that is you this morning and you are aware of your need of His grace and you're looking to Christ, you are invited to come and feast upon Him during this time. If you wish not to take communion, we just encourage you to remain in your seat and uh, to consider the, uh, the song and consider the passage that we've looked at. If you are taking communion, we invite you to come forward. We'll have some ushers dismiss us by rows. We'll have two stations here, and so you'll come up, and the, the, uh, the, the juice and the, the wafer are kind of in the same package together. We're doing it COVID style here. And so come up, get that, return to your seat, hold it, hold the elements, don't take them till we've all got them and seated, and then we will take them together as one body. So we encourage you, uh, followers of Christ, to come and feast upon Him. Um, On the night in which He was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said this is my body which is broken for you take and eat from it all of you and in like manner after the supper he took the cup and he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of your sins for as often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in glory so followers of Jesus we invite you to come and feast upon Christ by faith